Welcome to Pharma Drama, the channel where we look at the science of healthcare and healthcare products. Today we're going to look at a method of drying that's very commonly used on a commercial scale for making free flowing powders, spray drying. Spray dryers are efficient, cheap to operate, and unlike me, who needs to keep stopping for coffee, can operate continuously. So if you're ready, let's make a start. Spray dryers are used to dry solutions and suspensions. That might sound odd to you. Why would anyone want to dry a solution? <laughs> Surely it's supposed to be wet. And that of course is true. If the final product is a solution or suspension, then it doesn't need to be dried. But there are many other reasons why materials are dissolved during processing. The principal reason is that dissolving several materials in solution is an excellent method of mixing. When molecules are dissolved, they can freely interact, so that when the water is removed, the powder obtained should be homogeneous and perfectly mixed. Another is to control the physical form of a compound. Sometimes a specific polymorph, or maybe even an amorphous form, is needed, and it may be possible to obtain it by rapid precipitation from solution. Since in spray drying, the removal of water is rapid, as we shall see in a bit, it is quite often the case that a metastable or amorphous form is obtained. In fact, on a research scale, spray drying is often used to prepare amorphous forms of materials. And finally, since spray drying generally produces spherical particles, spray dried powders tend to be very free flowing. So you can see that spray drying is really useful as it allows us to make powders with very useful properties. How then does a spray dryer work? Like all methods of drying, perhaps with the exception of freeze drying, it's actually very simple. Schematically, it looks like this. The key components are a feed solution, a pump to feed the solution to be dried into the dryer, a supply of hot air, an atomizing nozzle, a drying chamber, and a cyclone. Of course, this represents the most simple setup and more complicated arrangements are possible. But this lets us understand the basic principles. The key to spray drying is atomization. Hot air and the solution to be dried are both fed to the atomizing nozzle. As the hot air rushes through the nozzle, it creates a low pressure region behind it, which pulls the solution along. As the solution is forced out of the nozzle, it breaks up into small droplets and is atomized, forming an aerosol. This process, the Venturi principle, is exactly the same mechanism that carburetors use in car engines. Although most cars now use electronic fuel injection, so only old people like me remember carburetors. Being liquid, the droplets form spheres when aerosolized because spheres have the smallest surface area to volume ratio of any geometric shape. The droplets pass into the drying chamber, which is heated and this causes evaporation of water from the droplets. Being small, the droplets dry very rapidly. The drying time of an individual droplet is typically only one to two seconds. This is why spray drying is so efficient to operate. Larger particles then drop to the bottom of the drying chamber and are collected. Smaller particles will still be suspended in the air, however, and they must be removed somehow. This is achieved with a cyclone, a column of air spinning round and round. Since solids are more dense than liquids, under centrifugal force, they will move to the outside of the cyclone chamber. The air is exhausted to waste while the particles run down the side of the chamber and are collected at the bottom. Clever stuff, I think you'd agree. Real spray dryers can be slightly more complicated than this, sometimes having two cyclones, and they often have filters on the exhaust to prevent escape of fine dust. But the basic principles of operation are the same. The image on the screen, taken with a scanning electron microscope, 
show some typical particles that were made by spray drying. You can see that they are very smooth and spherical. Their shape comes from the drying process. The droplets are spherical, as I noted earlier, so as they dry, the precipitate is also spherical. They are smooth because as drying is so rapid, the molecules don't have time to crystallize and so become amorphous. And we end up with smooth, free flowing powders. I should note here that not all compounds can be made amorphous by spray drying. If a compound can crystallize in less than one or two seconds, we will get crystalline particles. In addition to being used to mix materials or make free flowing powders, spray drying is often used to make powders for inhalation. You might think it's easy to breathe powders into your lung, but actually it's quite difficult. If the particles are too big, they impact the throat. And if they're too small, they go into the lung, but are then breathed out again. To deliver drugs to the lungs, we need particles with a very specific size range usually between two and five micrometers. These are difficult to make. Trust me, I've tried. But by controlling the conditions of the spray dryer, and I think you can imagine there are quite a few variables, flow rate of solution, air pressure, air temperature, nozzle temperature, cyclone velocity, and temperature, to name but a few, we can make powders exactly in this size range. So you will frequently see that spray drying is used to make powders for inhalation. You might also say to me, can we only remove water or can we start with other solvents? And that would be a good question. The answer is we can indeed use other solvents, typically organic solvents in the pharmaceutical field. We just have to be a bit careful since many organic solvents are rather volatile and flammable. Hence, it can be kind of risky to use hot air to atomize an organic solvent because of the three things needed to cause an explosion, fuel, oxygen, and a spark, two are present in the spray dryer. It is much safer if you need to remove an organic solvent to use compressed nitrogen to atomize the sample since there is then no oxygen in the system at all. Spray dryers can be constructed to almost any scale, from laboratory instruments that can dry just a few milliliters of solution to massive commercial rigs that can dry liters of solution per second. An additional benefit of spray drying is that it can operate continuously, and that is massively important from a commercial perspective. And that is all we need to know about spray drying. Spray dryers work by atomizing solutions into a heated drying chamber. The heat causes rapid evaporation of water and the solidification of any solute to create spherical particles. As solids are denser than liquids, the dry particles collect at the bottom of the chamber. Smaller particles are separated from the hot air in a cyclone. They are spun to the outside of the chamber under centrifugal force and the humid air is exhausted to waste. Spray dryers produce spherical, free-flowing and often amorphous powders and are typically used to mix materials or make powders for inhalation. Because they can operate continuously and dry droplets in just one or two seconds, they are extremely cost-effective to run. I hope that made sense. If it did, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. It really helps the channel. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.